we have described so far um, focal liver lesions, nodules in the patient at risk, which is mainly uh, liver cirrhosis. And we have the role of contrasound ultrasound for the diagnosis of metastasis uh, and evidence-based medicine and personal experience shown by uh, fascinating cases. What to do? There is also a role of contrasound ultrasound in planning, guidance, monitoring, follow-up of focal ablation treatment therapies in liver cancer. Professor Eddie Lynn uh, from London uh, is very much experienced from the very beginning of contrasound ultrasound. Uh, and um, he will um, explain and present on uh, treatment options using local ablative treatment strategies. Dear Eddie, I'm happy to introduce you uh, from London or Glasgow, from where are you presenting right now? Uh, and uh, the screen is uh, for you. Thank you. Okay, so it's a very long title. Basically, I'm just going to talk about the role of CUS in the focal ability therapies of liver cancer. So to start with, um, what are the indications for ablation? So first of all, the largest population is really in colorectal cancer patients with liver metastasis. And we see a lot more of these patients who are unsuitable for surgical resection, largely due to inadequate surgical margin or liver reserve, because a lot of these patients will have had chemotherapy. And also there may be coexisting mor morbidities such as heart disease or other uh, mor uh, morbidity. Uh, more often now, we see patients, we treat those patients who are unsuitable for further chemotherapy for cardio and neurotoxicity. And more importantly also, we use it as an adjunct to liver resection intraoperatively uh, with the surgeon. But also, which is a lot more uh, commonly seen, is uh, patient choose to have ablation rather than major surgery. In the second cohort of patients, uh, it's with patients with hepatocellular carcinoma, uh, more importantly as a bridging treatment before liver transplantation. And there's another category of patients that are not fulfilling the Milan criteria, or we can use the ablation to downstage the disease to fulfill the criteria so that the patient can then have liver transplant. In a smaller proportion of patients with neuroendocrine tumors, uh, because these are slow growing tumors, there is benefit of using ablative therapy to control the disease. And lastly, patients with breast melanoma or renal metastasis into the liver, uh, but they need to show stability of the disease for four to six months with no extra hepatic disease, or at least should have small volume disease. We have different types of ablative techniques and conventionally, we have the thermal techniques, which is mostly the microwave ablation and the radio frequency ablation. There's also roles for high through and cryoablation, but for the liver, we are really mainly looking at using microwave or radio frequency. Non-thermal techniques consist of chemical ablation with ethanol or acetic acid, but this has long uh, been discontinued given the efficacy of RFA, especially in the case of hepatocellular carcinoma and they have never really seen any role for metastasis of the liver, sorry, in the liver. But more recently, over the last five, seven years, there has been an increased usage of irreversible electroporation as a non-thermal technique to ablate tumors where location of the tumors uh, like adjacent to vessels or, um, or more vital structures like gallbladder or bowel uh, could be more tricky using the thermal technique because of potential risk of complications. So the IRE is reserved in those cases because it's a safer technique. Now we mostly use this ablative technique percutaneously, but obviously we do have surgeons that do it intraoperatively or by laparoscopy. It's done under general anesthesia in our case, or it can also be done especially for the liver under heavy sedation if we don't have the facility of general anesthetic in the department. And for guidance, um, 
ultrasound and CUS is most commonly used, although we can, do, we can still use CT or MR in very tricky cases. This slide here illustrates the three modalities that I'm going to talk about, the RFA, microwave, and IRE. The generators are seen at the top end of the slides, and the various needle size and technique that uh, we use uh, for the different types of tumors. So the purpose of CUS for ablation is really in the first place, staging and planning. That is more importantly for those tumors which are not visible on the Bay mode scan and only visible on the contrast mode. So these were what I call the occult uh, liver tumors. But more importantly, we can't assume every lesion that we see on the liver are actually malignant. So where there is a need for characterization, and we'll show some examples where that is important. It's also very important to use the technique from the point of view of targeting, given that ultrasound is real time imaging, we can actually, with the use of CUS, identify and target the needle into those occult lesions. And also there is some planning that needs to be done in terms of larger lesions above five centimeters, whereby you need multiple needle placement and also targeting where the active part of the tumor is. Thirdly, we use the CUS over the period procedural period to assess monitoring whether the, the ablation has been complete. And more commonly also is to look for potential complications, which is an important aspect of using the technique. And lastly, as a follow-up for looking at local recurrence and also in identifying new lesions, and this applies more so for looking at hepatocellular carcinoma treatment rather than metastasis. Just to give you an example of a cult, example of a cult metastasis, as you can see here in the grayscale scan, it's fairly difficult to just actually identify any of the focal lesions, but with the contrast, you can see there are multiple lesions. There is a time gap between the diagnosis or the staging of the last CT scan to the timing of the ablation. And what we've seen sometimes in aggressive tumors that we can find multiple focal lesions at the time of the ablation period itself. And as in, the case, as in this case here, where we see multiple liver metastases, and clearly this is not, no longer an indication for RFA, and hence we've managed to save this patient from having ability therapy when this patient needs more systemic chemotherapy. In terms of characterization, in patients who have had long, uh, long periods of chemotherapy, we see fatty, cha fatty change of the liver and focal areas of fat sparing. And these are easily identified on the contrast scan compared to the grayscale scan, which really gives you these pseudo lesions. When in fact, as you can see here, this area is enhanced just as much as the, the liver and hence is a focal area of fat sparing rather than tumor. And as been uh, talked earlier on, CT is not, can make uh, mistakes in terms of identifying hemangiomas, and these are easily identified as uh, hemangiomas uh, with the filling, nodular filling defect, sorry, uh, nodular filling in the latter phase of scanning. And we spare this patient from another ablation. But more commonly, patients that have uh, multiple ablation, ablation in the past, the question is really trying to identify what is uh, previous treated lesions and what are new lesions. As you can see on the contrast scan, it's easily uh, identified as ablation zone here compared to the new metastases. And that's clearly very important. One other aspect uh, of, of, of using contrast also is to delineate the tumor. And that really to allow us to get a proper, a proper measurement of the tumor so that we can choose the right needles or use multiple needle approach to ablate the tumor. Here, it's going, you can see it's, it's not so, so difficult or a problem, I should say, when the lesions are significantly uh, smaller than three centimeters, but when the lesions are a bit larger, it does become important to know the true size of the lesion. And sometimes you have to wait until the portal late phase to really define on the washout the true margin of the tumor. 
So in terms of the targeting for the occult lesions, whether it's for BAMSI or for FA, you can see the importance of using the jaw screen. On the grayscale, it's quite difficult to see the lesion itself. We can see the tumor as a filling defect of the contrast scan. And as we move the needle, we only see the needle on the grayscale, but we don't see it on the contrast scan because it's subtracted at the same time, unless it is moving like we've done here on the biopsy shot. You can see that. Now we can see the truck of the needle. So the, from the point of view, the biopsy is important because we know we want to go touch the edge of the lesion rather to the center because we don't want to get necrotic material. So the targeting using the jewel screen for the cut lesions is essential in this case. Now for large lesions, especially with hepatocercosinoma that have undergone, for example, transarterial chemomobilizations, we always left with residual disease. And it is important to do the CEO scan so that then we can target the residual active component of the tumor. As you can see here, there's, a, there's, there's still enhancement of the hepatoma here and on the left-hand side as well. And this is post RFA on the previously traced taste patient. Now you can see complete devascularization of that large uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. Now we mic with microwave ablation, when, when one is trying to target the lesion, so you can see the tumor here, the enhancement, you can see the margin quite clearly, but with the microwave, we need to look at the nidus of the needle. The nidus is really the junction between the ceramic component of the needle and the metallic part of the needle. Now, this has to be in the center of the lesion because the heat starts from the nidus and outwards. So that has, that's how we target the lesion. Once the nidus is right in the center of the lesion, you can see the development of the cloud burst that fills in the tumor over time. And this is the post-contrast scan showing a bit of shrinkage, which we can see through desiccation of the, of the, of the ablation zone. And it does look smaller. It doesn't always look bigger. Although we try to make the ablation zone bigger than the original tumor. And now when we compare it with RFA, it's the other way, it's the other way around where we're trying to get the tip end of the needle about two to five millimeters beyond the margin of the tumor to be in the correct position. Once the needle is the right position, you can see the, uh, you saw the ablation, you can see the uh, cloud burst over the tumor. And this is the post RFA uh, result showing complete devascularization and the quite short margin of the RFA. So IRE, so this is irreversible erythropoiesis. Why do we use IRE for the liver? It's mostly, as I said earlier on, is for the safety purpose. So for lesions that are lying in the subcapsular area, because ablating that with thermal techniques can be quite painful afterwards, whereas the pain, uh, fresh, sorry, is much less painful using RFA in the subcapsular area. And areas in the hilum where there are vessels, so we want to avoid uh, you know, the main portal vein or hepatic artery, and also for uh, gallbladder, and if we're treating a lesions, which is really quite close to the gallbladder wall or the uh, large bowel or duodenum, we want to use the uh, IRE rather than RFA or microwave. Now, the only difference is that the needle is, is significantly smaller, the caliber of the needle is significantly smaller compared to the RFA or the uh, microwave it's actually can be quite difficult to see, oh, I don't know why it's moving, sorry. It's quite difficult to see the needle track. And I've actually marked the two ends by the plus point here. Now, once the ablation started, you can see now the needle track, okay? And then you'll see the little burst of bubbles there, mostly for electrolysis rather than for a heat effect. There's no heat effect with IRE. Now, immediately after the IRE ablation, you can see the margin still has, as well defined compared to the RFA or microwave, but you can see still the integrity of the central vessels initially, but you can see the vascularization 
uh, of the ablation zone there. And 10 minutes late, oops, sorry. I'm struggle here, yeah. So 10 minutes later, we already have involution and still see the needle track and they don't see any vascularity now. This scan was done really to, to, while we were ablating the uh, most superficial lesion. Another example where we would use IRE, as you can see, patient has had previous right epitectomy, local recurrence at the margin of recession, right by the left portal vein. And you don't really use RFA or microwave in that situation, given the, 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 the uh, close, close proximity of the bowel loop here, and more importantly, the vessel, which can give you this heat sink effect as well, and makes ablation less effective. You see that tumor on the PET scan and on the 3D uh, uh, colored up ultrasound scan. We use a monopolar, uh, irrespect, ir uh, sorry, IRA needle in this case, that's the left portal vein here. That was immediately after the ablation, again, showing mostly devascularization, but the microcirculation still, there is still some circulation seen, but as you wait long enough, these will disappear. And the CT scan here shows involution, you know, after a few weeks, the tumor here getting smaller, as you can see on the CT scan. Another example where we use the RE, this is a lot, there was a large tumor that did not respond to previous RFA. You can still see a residual vascularity in that ablated zone by the RFA. And I think one of the problems also was the fact that the tumor was quite close to the left uh, hepatic vein. And we targeted those area vascularity with our IRE needles here. This is right underneath the, di the diaphragm. That's why you can see the hot pulsating here. But this is the post IRE scan again, complete devascularization of the uh, ablation zone there. This is six weeks post IRE. And we again, we can see the involution that is the shrinkage of that ablation, which is much quicker compared to uh, tumors that we ablate with RFA or microwave. Now, how do we know local recurrence? This is the ablation zone here, but you can see at the margin of that ablation zone, arterial vascularization, but more importantly, it washes out in the portal late phase, okay? So that we know is local recurrence and we can target uh, that area again for repeat ablation to control the disease. So, in terms of monitoring response, what are the differences between the thermal and non-thermal technique? Irrespective, for complete coagulation, we want to see complete loss of enhancement for both techniques. The margin on RFA tends to be very sharp, whereas with IRE, it is certainly less sharp and uh, ill-defined as, as we des describe it. We know, we suspect there's residual disease similar to both cases where the margin is ill-defined and there is enhancement of that area in the arterial phase. And more importantly, we see washout in the portal and late phases. For follow up uh, post ablation, metastasis and CUS, we just scan at four to six weeks after the ablation to see whether the ablation has been complete. But there are, thereafter, for colorectal cancer, we do not use CUS. We tend to go for CT scan because we're not just focusing on the liver, we're also looking for extrahepatic metastases. So hence the CT is more comprehensive in terms of follow-up or surveillance of colorectal cancer. And with HCC at three months to four months, we use an MRI scan routinely in our practice. As I said, one of the function or role of CUS post-ablation is also, or during ablation, is to look for complications. We can see here intrahepatic subcapsular large hematoma. This patient did not need any intervention given that the hematoma was stable. On the other hand, we had a patient that had an active bleeding within that. That was in fact a pseudoaneurysm and that was confirmed on angiogram straight away, as you can see here. And this patient embolized that pseudoaneurysm straight away and the post uh, embolization showed a large uh, hematoma afterwards. But the key, the key point here 
there's no enhancement, so there's total control of that uh, pseudoaneurysm. So in summary, ablative therapy, as we know, is now routine practice in most uh, teaching hospitals. And what we know is that CUS is an essential tool in the staging process, the guidance, and the peri-procedural monitoring, as well as the follow-up of liver cancer patients. Thank you. Yeah, Eddie Lean, Professor Eddie Lina from London. Thank you so much for your presentation and clear uh, description on techniques and success rate, uh, the comparison of the different methods and uh, yeah, it was such clear that no uh, questions uh, are on my uh, screen so far. So um, I might say a few words on EFSOM, European Federation of Societies for Ultrasound Medicine and Biology. Um, in one year, it, uh, the, there will be happy birthday, 50 years. Uh, EFSOM has published on Contrasnan's ultrasound uh, on 2004. Eddie, you have been part of the uh, CEOs guidelines uh, in those days. They have been updated 2011 and 2012, and most recently um, in conjoint venture uh, with the um, the FUMP uh, 2020, a few months ago. And there have been also uh, guidelines on interventional ultrasound in 2016. And uh, if you are interested, uh, all that guidelines uh, and information can be taken from the FSOM website if you are FSOM member. So there's real uh, value to be an FSOM member and uh, evidence-based uh, the recommendations have been written and published uh, during that time. Okay, there's one question. Do you not use ablation for HTC as treatment choice? Oh, absolutely. Um, it is first choice. Uh, we use the Barcelona Clinic uh, guidelines to, uh, to use ablation uh, for HCC. Um, you know, as you know, in our part of the world, uh, we see a lot more metastases uh, than HCCs uh, at this stage still. So um, hence, you know, a lot of my slides is more vast out uh, metastasis than HCC, but we do uh, routinely ablate uh, small HCCs, of course. So what are the criteria? When do you go for surgery? When uh, do you recommend surgery? When do you recommend uh, local ablative treatment? Until which size do you allow uh, local treatment HCC? Could you give a few uh, sentences on that. Well, yeah, absolutely. So uh, at the moment, uh, as long as you fulfill the Milan criteria, uh, we would uh, ablate because largely there's such a waiting list for liver transplant. So we want to get control of the disease as long as you fill the Milan criteria, which is less than three lesions, less than three centimeters, and uh, or single lesion less than five centimeters. So these are the that's the, the main Milan criteria. And sometimes what we can do if we, we, if we have, uh, if the patient is just above the Milan criteria, uh, we can downstage to become the Milan criteria so that the patient then becomes suitable for liver transplant. Well, that's great. So a uh, question came from Stephanie Wilson, famous, uh, famous clinician uh, uh, and ultrasonographer from uh, Canada. So that's great. Um, there's a question from Tudor Moga. What about the cost? Does it cost? Uh, and the comparison is uh, between RFA and microwave and um, uh, those different methods. Uh, are there um, differences we have to take care of? Oh, absolutely. Um, ideally, we'd already want to use uh, costs into making clinical decisions but there is, a, there is significant difference between the costs. Let's put it that way. I mean, I'm giving you in terms of UK prices, um, there is about a 30% more expensive microwave compared to the RFA needle. Uh, so that's just need, the needle costs. 
and IRE, just to get an example, I mean, uh, for IFA, the needle is about 900 pounds. Uh, microwave would be in the regional 1,400 pounds. And IRE, where we actually use a pair of needles, the needles are about 3,000 pounds for the pair. So, so just in terms of the needle costs, uh, that is significant. And Brexit does not influence the costs or? No, not that we've seen so far. <laughs> not so far. Yeah, uh, I don't see uh, any uh, further questions uh, on, on my screen. Uh, ah, there's one. Uh, um, to Edeline, thank you for your excellent presentation. Do you use seals just after ablation in order to make sure that the ablation is complete? How long do you wait for the burst to disappear? So when to do contrast uh, and when to avoid? What is a good strategy on that? Okay, so we, uh, we have the luxury of having both CT and ultrasound in the same room. So I actually do it on the CT scan room uh, routinely nowadays. But so because largely we do a CT scan as a planning scan, and then I, you know, and then I do not I do the CUS scan as planning. And if the tumor is visible on the ultrasound with CUS, sometimes it can be tri tricky even with CUS. It's just even for guidance. So we use the CUS for guidance as well. Okay. Uh, and then, so it is as I described, uh, you know, that's how I do all the ablations, uh, contrast with ultrasound and with CT as well on the side for difficult cases, okay? Uh, so how long do I need to wait? The answer is actually is about seven to 10 minutes uh, when we actually see disappearance of the cloud burst. Uh, the key thing is that you may not necessarily see all the gas disappearing. What you need to look at in real time is whether those echogenic uh, echoes inside the ablation zone, whether they're moving or not, okay? Because what you want to look at is really the circulation. And that's really what's gonna define the ablation zone, okay? So you don't always have to wait. I tend to go by your know, rule of thumb, two, three minutes, give an injection of one ml, see what's happening. And, you know, because it's variable. What you don't really want to be doing is wasting time, waiting exactly for 10 minutes, and then you give the contrast. I tend to literally two, three minutes later, when the needles come out, you know, give it, give a shot of you know, 0.5 or one ml of the of of the of Cineview and look at how much circulation there is within that ablation zone. Okay. You one has to watch out, obviously. The, what I, I forgot to talk about is that you will have this peripheral rim of benign enhancement. Uh, because of inflammation. And how you differentiate is the fact that this rim of enhancement persists throughout the arterial phase, portal phase, and late phase. You can, keep, you can see that uh, enhancing, okay? What you don't want is uh, the washout. The washout will tell you that you have missed, you have left behind tumor, and you want to go back and hit that area. And that's the key point about looking at whether the ablation has been complete or not. Size of, so measuring the size of the actual ablation zone can be quite deceptive in what, as I said to you, in some of the cases when you use microwave, for example, you get so much desiccation that actually you have, the ablations actually become smaller than the actual original tumor size. And that, does, it, does it actually mean that you have not achieved ablations? No, so one has to be careful. So that's why it is important to look for the circulation or the micro bubbles within the tumor and whether there's a washout afterwards. Yeah, thank you. There's a next question on secondary surveillance. We have uh, how to say follow up. We can use uh, contrasounds, ultrasound. We can use MRI. We can use both alternating. So um, we can, yeah. What what are your recommendations? So. From um, Stephanie Wilson, we got the information that she uses uh, contrasounds ultrasound for surveillance, alternating, uh, alternating with MRI. Do you think uh, it's uh, a good approach? Uh, what are, um, uh, yeah, uh, just uh, I wonder about your comments and discussions. 
I think it's based on it's based on the prime on the on the original tumor. For colorectal cancer, we don't do surveillance with uh, CUS at every three months. As I said earlier on, is that we will use we will use CT scan because we're not looking just at the liver. We're also looking for extra hepatic disease. That's what tends to affect colorectal cancer, and would be a concern. Okay. For hepatocellular carcinoma, I think there is a role for actually doing surveillance if that's what all you're looking for, because the incidence of extra hepatic metastasis in the case of hepatomas is much is 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 rarer. Okay, so you can actually make a case if that is what your department is used to, uh, and that's the, that would be my approach. Metastasis, we tend to go for CT scan because we want to know there's a spreading disease, and if there's any. Uh, difficulty in knowing whether there has been, uh, whether there's a residual disease on the CT scan, then we would do a CUS scan. So we're a bit more selective based on what we see on the CT scan afterwards. But we would do that routinely. Thank you. Um, what kind of CUS innovations do you want to see in the future for improved HCC diagnosis and management? What do you wish from the manufacturers from, um, yeah, uh, what are your wishful thinking for the future? Well, I think we need to be able to do uh, 3D, rapid 3D acquisitions. I think imaging a single plane is, it can be limited. And what I would like to see in the future also is really automated uh, diagnosis. I mean, there's some software is already available and it's just a question of putting this in practice. And this is really to be able to fast track uh, the whole process and getting accuracy better as well. So these are the two key things I would like to see. Um, artificial intelligence, can this have a role in enhancing accuracy of HTC diagnosis with conscious enhanced ultrasound? I, I think so. I like to think so. I mean, there are algorithms whereby we make the diagnosis, so there's no reason why we can't use the computer to be able to make these algorithms to make the diagnosis. And you take away some of the elements, uh, so the, some, some of the subjective element that we, we, we have. So to, to, for that to be successful, clearly we need, we still need better quantification packages to be able to look at the washing or washout relative to the liver and so forth. If I might jump into that. So what kind of software do we need inside uh, of the ultrasound machine, outside? Uh, do we need a comparability between manufacturers that can be only outside of a machine? What kind of, uh, how to say, parameters uh, are the better ones? Uh, could you give a short, uh, how to say, uh, you, you, you mentioned uh, you wish better uh, software. So what kind of improvements do we need? Well, this, this is a discussion we've had for the last 10 years. <laughs> and we're still working on that. So, um, and, and again, the, being able to do cross platforms, uh, whether it's online or uh, online, uh, these are major difficulties is still, I would say. How do you rate the visibility of the ceramic tip of microwave ablation applicators? Uh, <laughs> it's very difficult because, you know, the, the ceramic component is actually quite polished. And in fact, the only bit of the ceramic you see is actually the very tip end. So if you're not in the right plane to see the tip end, so the tip end of the ceramic is got uh, angulated uh, sharpness. So, so that's what you see as an echo, but it's just a dot. This is the issue with ultrasound. Unless you're bang on, uh, aligned with that, you may not see it. So that's why I actually look at the nidus part of the, uh, of the needle. So the junction between the metallic part and the ceramic, okay. Um, which ultrasound machines, models, manufacturers are especially suited for contrasnance ultrasound? So uh, <laughs> Eddie is running um, away. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, 
<laughs> no, uh, the question is to uh, go back home. Uh, so, um, uh, who is on the payroll of which manufacturer? Which one is recommended uh, so best? Since I, you are, green, I am not on the payroll. I'm not on the payroll of any pay, uh, any manufacturers. Uh, I use a variety of machines at the moment, so I can say I have uh, G and I have Philips machine that I'm um, working. With. Would you agree that? Uh, almost all or most high-end machines to a certain degree allow us to follow the evidence-based recommendations published by guidelines. Would you um, allow I would agree. That? I think most, most manufacturers, high-end machines are very good nowadays. Yeah. So um, finally, uh, somewhat philosophically, uh, we can... <laughs> answer uh, that uh, question <laughs> in that way to get out of uh, <laughs> any uh, so problematic well, discussions. I'm just, being open. I'm just being open about what I use. Yeah, and, and I'm not on a payroll on anybody. <laughs> so uh, finally, we come to an end of uh, one of those uh, pretty successful FSOM webinars. Uh, and um, I'm happy uh, for all that uh, presentations and that very good discussion uh, right now. Uh, please visit FSUMP website, please visit WFUMP website. Um, there's a lot uh, going on of uh, educational and scientific activities. And um, thank you so so much for uh, uh, for pres presenting uh, um, and uh, for listening on the other side. Hopefully, you have a beautiful uh, day. Not too much rain uh, right now in mid Europe. There's a lot of rain. I've never seen such a bad springtime. So it's good to perform scientific work and educational activities. And um, yeah, to all of you uh, in Europe and around the world, uh, have a, a very uh, have a very good time. And thank you for sharing. And thank thank you for discussing. And thank you for listening. Bye bye. Thank bye bye you. together. <laughs>